John, welcome to the, to the um, show. Thank you for having me. Can you please uh, introduce yourself? Sure, my name is John D'Agostino. Uh, I'm CEO of my own firm, Dagger Consulting LLC. Um, and so I'm working on a few projects right now. I sit on the boards of directors of some very large asset management firms. I am a senior advisor to Coinbase, the cryptocurrency exchange, and in charge of, of strategic partnerships. And I am the CEO of an EdTech SPAC. So a very impressive track record. You, you know, you're doing a lot of different things. So I'm first, so the first question is, um, What's the mission of your company or what you're trying to do? So I think in all these things, the mission is to be impactful. Um, so you said something to me before the camera started rolling, which I thought was great, which is you, you talk about as an investor, understanding your strengths and weaknesses and understanding that you're probably not going to be the person to invent that new big company, but your role in the ecosystem is to empower that individual. So what I read into when, I, when I, you know, we just met each other, but what that tells me is you're a pretty self-aware person. Uh, that you understand where your strengths lie and you understand your role in the overall ecosystem. So you want to accomplish something and you know how the best way is to do it. Um, similarly, I know, I know myself. Uh, I'm more of an intrapreneur. I do well when I'm housed within a, you know, maybe medium to large size organization that empowers me to make, to, to do, to make change. Um, I've been very, very lucky. I teach a class at MIT in Columbia and what that's done is put me in touch with true intellectual capacity. And I think it's very humbling. You know, all of us have had some moderate success in our lives. It's very easy for us to start thinking of ourselves as superior intellectual beings. But when you're around actual advanced intellectual capacity, it's like being around a bodybuilder. If you think you're strong and you go to the world's strongest man contest, you realize your limitations. If you think you're smart and you stroll through MIT's media lab, um, you quickly realize you have to find your role. Doesn't mean it's diminished from what they can do because they don't have skills that we might have. Um, but that self-awareness is so crucial. So my mission is, uh, I know what drives me. It's um, partially monetary, but it's mostly, um, I, want to, I want to change the world. I want to do something important. I want to leave a legacy for my children they can be proud of. Um, and so the, the key part is finding out where I'll be value add, just like you did. It's very, very, it's, um, I mean, we share very similar views and um, I guess it's just, knowing where you stand, what you can do, and how you can get other people to help you, and we do you know, greater good, right? So second question is, um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, how have you or your company been innovative? So I'll talk about the EdTech SPAC. Uh, it's publicly listed, so it's public information. Um, COVID, uh, uh, it's called uh, Addit EdTech Acquisition Corp. So addicts.u. COVID, um, in the EdTech world, COVID uh, accelerated existing trends. Um, it will change things, it will change human behavior. I don't think anyone knows yet. Everyone's got a thesis, no one has any clue. The thing about unprecedented events is they're unprecedented, and so you have no data to judge them. So I have an opinion as to how it'll change. I actually think the world will look strikingly similar in five years, will look more similar to two years ago than most people think it will. I think we're creatures of habit. Now, but. On the as surface. In, as, in, as, in, as in it will go pre-COVID? It'll look like pre-COVID. Okay. So for example, cruise ship bookings are way up. Yeah. Uh, Disneyland in California uh, opened up uh, about three weeks ago. They were sold out in less than two minutes. So I think there were creatures of habit. There's a reason we've developed cities over hundreds and hundreds of years. There's a reason we've developed certain systems of behavior. And I think even a year to two year pandemic will have difficulty changing some of those core behaviors. Optically on the surface from a macro perspective. However, underneath, there will be pretty substantive changes uh, because a year and a half is a long time. I'll tell you a quick story. I was giving, uh, there was a gentleman here who was a CEO of CalPERS, CIO of CalPERS. I, I gave the keynote address at CalPERS last year, big pension fund conference. And there was a panel I watched with um, pension CIOs and one of them was from New Orleans, the city in the US that suffered massive hurricanes years ago. And he was saying how in his district, all of the pensioners receive their checks electronically, not through mail. And the other pension CIOs kind of rolled their eyes and said, wow, I wish, I wish we could do that. My pensioners would never agree. They love their mail. And he got quiet and said, you have to understand, in 2006, when Hurricane Katrina hit the city of New Orleans, something like 40% of the people had no physical address. There was no place to send the check. And he said something so powerful. He said, you'll be amazed how even a 90-year-old pensioner learns to embrace technology if it's the difference between eating and not eating. So there's no choice. COVID will force change. I think with education, 
it'll be sector dependent, it'll be geography dependent, it'll be social class dependent. What we certainly have seen is a significant acceleration of adoption of online learning models. Now whether those are going to plateau as we have a return to school, um, because obviously school is more than education, school is daycare, school is socialization, uh, it remains to be seen. Um, but that's how we're thinking. We're thinking what are the business models we think will emerge from this rapid acceleration and be sustainable, uh, not, just, not just a bubble. Understand. I mean, that's very um, enlightening. I think you're right. I think um, I personally feel that people going to Disneyland or going back to restaurants, it's not a creature of, of habit in, 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 my, in my sense. I think it's more to do with this. They've just been so bored and locked up for six months. They want to do everything. So I think you're right. There's going to be a massive rebound of airlines, hotels, people like in, in Chinese, we say revenge spending. You, we, we want to... <laughs> You know, that's why if you look at the luxury market, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Porsche, Hermes, Chanel, all the top brands, they've had record-breaking years during COVID. But do you think it will attract? Do you think it will correct? Or it, stay, it, will, it's, it will keep growing, but maybe not as powerful because people will then spend more money on other things, like holidays, okay. property, when it's lower, companies, and so on. Anyway, um, last question. Um, please share with us your number one advice to young entrepreneurs and business leaders. If you're a young entrepreneur, and again, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur. I never had the courage to be an entrepreneur. So, so take my advice with a grain of salt. What I would say, though, is someone who has done some interesting things within large companies. Um, if anyone tells you to follow your dream or some similar platitude, smile and walk away. And what I encourage young people to do, whether it's they can be an entrepreneur or work inside a company, is find out what the most boring aspect of that path is and ask yourself, if 20 to 30 percent or 50 percent of my day is the boring part of what I do, if it's filling out healthcare data for my employees and picking an insurance policy for my company, whatever, whatever you hate, whatever you find boring, if you can do that and you can do that with um, vigor, then that's the path for you. Everyone can do the fun part. Everyone can do the exciting, passionate part. It's the folks who can power through the mundane trivialities of the reality of that effort that truly succeed. And I'll tell you a very quick story. So I went to Harvard Business School. Really, really smart people. There's one of my best friends there who I knew I was smarter than. I just had more intellectual horsepower than him. I was not the smartest person there, but I knew I was smarter than my buddy. We took a class in fixed income bond pricing. I hated it. I found it excruciating. He loved it. He ran circles around me because he was passionate about it and he was interested in it. If you're not passionate, someone with less intellectual horsepower will outwork you and outperform you every day of the week. I agree. So, John, excellent advice. Thank you. Um, you have to, I guess the takeaway, guys, is that uh, one is you gotta do the boring stuff as well as the exciting stuff. Everyone wants to do, do it the, well. Do you gotta it do well. it well. And then the second one is be passionate, love what you do. Even, even the stuff you hate. Absolutely. Cheers. John, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for Take your time. Take care. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.